Welcome into the flagship podcast, everybody. I am Chip Brown of Horns247.com. Very excited to be joined by the all-time points leader among kickers and the number three scorer all-time in Texas football history, Cameron Dicker. Yes, Cameron, how are you doing? Doing good. How are you? Hey, doing uh, doing great. Excited to have you on the flagship podcast. And um, I mean, what a what a season uh, for you. What a career, but what a season for you because everybody knows you as Dicker, the kicker, mm -hmm. but you end up first team all Big 12 as Dicker, the punter. <laughs> I mean, 46.7 yards per punt. Um, you had a, you had a decision to make at the end of your, um, senior season, because you did have a COVID-19 red shirt year that you could have used. Um, but you're getting ready to go to the NFL combine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a hard decision to make. It was definitely one. I mean, it took me, I don't even remember what day I announced it, but it took me like till that day to decide and of the deadline. We, we didn't go to a bowl game. And so we had, a, I had a lot of time to decide. And so um, it was definitely a hard decision just because, you know, I love Texas and would love to be there another year. But at the same time, I think it's, you're presented with opportunities in life and sometimes you have to take them. So. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, for me. yeah, it's, and how, how aggressively did, what were the conversations like with Sark and Jeff Banks about you possibly coming back? Next year. Yeah, it was uh, with Banks. He was just telling me that it'd be it's a big role that I'd play on the team next year. And that, um, I mean, he just really wants me there one more year to kind of do everything again and make sure that he doesn't have to kind of because it's going to be all new guys next year. And so he wanted at least somebody to have done something in that room, but it's going to be good for them. I mean, I know those dudes are going to be ready. And so it was just more so, hey, come back. We think this will be good for you for this reason and that kind of stuff. But it was one of those decisions where at the end of the day I'm making and making it based on what I think is best and long-term. Well, while we're on that subject of, you know, those got the dudes will, you know, come through next year, you know, more about the dudes that are on the roster coming back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Burt Auburn, Isaac Pearson, um, what can you tell us about those guys? Yeah, great guys. Um, I think, I mean, obviously Isaac's the only punter there right now. They're going to be bringing probably a punter in in the summer because we we need another. You don't just have one punter on a team. And so all the dudes are going to have to compete for a spot. Um, if things go well, it's Isaac's spot. Uh, if he performs like he should. And then Bert is going to come in and Gabo Lozano will come in and they'll compete with Will Stone when he gets here in the summer and see how they do. They both did well last year uh, during the season, during practices and everything. So it'll be a good competition kind of for all the positions. It'll be good. Yeah. I mean, big, big shoes to fill uh, from Dicker the kicker. And, and Cameron, I mean, there's a lot to get into with your career because – you know, you came right in and and took over. And what way to introduce yourself to Texas fans then with the game winner against OU? Uh, nine seconds left, uh, the Red River shootout, the, the winking gif. Uh, I guess you were winking to Joseph Osai, is that right? I think so. Honestly, I, I believe so. Not even sure anymore. <laughs> Or the yeah, it was kind of the the chin yeah. up smile. Yeah. But you know, take us through your mindset uh, going out to make that kick. Um, what what's going through your mind? And obviously, you become an instant legend. Yeah, I mean, obviously, as a freshman, it's your first time being in there. You're wanting to do something to kind of make a name for yourself in that game, and it was just cool to kind of have that opportunity to do so. I remember at halftime forgot who it was, but a couple of people were like, this might come down to you. And I was like, let's do it. And so it's one of those things where you have to have that confidence going into it. And I know every day of the week that I'm working towards that. And so as a kicker, those are the kicks you want to have. And it just gave me the chance to go out and do what I do. And I was confident the whole time going out there. Um, and then just 
took care of business when we were out on the field and Justin and Ryan did a great job. I mean, if we had a very, very fast field goal operation and if we didn't get it off that fast, that kick probably should have been blocked. But um, we uh, did a great job and got it off real quick. And, I mean, all of us were freshmen, so it was really fun to kind of be able to do that in a high-pressure scenario. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it, uh, the call, I mean – you know, you had Gus Johnson on the call. Doesn't get any better than that. Mm -hmm. How many times have you watched that kick since? Uh, after it was like a couple times, but honestly, not that much. Yeah, I mean, not, not too too much. Well, you you out kind of outdid yourself. Um, you know, you you ended up with two uh, last play game winning field goals, only the eighth and ninth. Uh, game deciding plays as the as the gun is going off with your yeah. field goals against Kansas. Um, that was a 33 yarder, I believe, and they had gone for two, so you had to make that to win. Yeah, and you know you you make it. Obviously, Texas wins 50 48. It's it's crazy. What what do you remember about that situation? Um. Honestly, I just did not even have doubt with that. I was very confident going out on the field because I was like, well, we can't lose to Kansas. Jeez. Um, the end up happening this year wasn't great. But at that point, I got to delay it for a little bit. And um, I mean, they drove down the field. I remember I think they Sam threw it to Colin out of bounds or like right there at the sideline with like they ran another play with like seven seconds left and they got a huge play to make it a shorter kick for me. And so, I mean, I was very confident going out there on the field and just knew I had to make it. I mean, if, if we didn't, we were going to lose. And so I was, it was one of those things where you just go out and you treat it like every other kick. But I mean, it's one of those that I'm running out on the field, like I'm making this kick. Well, and then you do it again against Kansas state. Uh, mm -hmm. You kick the game winner. And in those situations, I remember asking Justin Tucker after, you know, he kicked the game winner against AM in 2011 in College Station. And, you know, he's he's very cerebral, but he's like, I'm just trying to make the same motion every time. You know, it. I don't even think about the surroundings. I just make sure I lock into my routine and try to make the same motion every time. Kind of like a golfer. Is that is that kind of how you look at it? Yeah, no, I mean, like I said a little bit earlier, it's every kick's the same kick uh, when you run out on the field. Whether it's like a 55-yarder, a 25-yarder, you're trying to kick it all in the same exact motion. You aren't trying to do anything different. And so that's one thing. Like I do kicking lessons, and that's one thing I try to tell kids early on because people are like, oh, I'll just barely hit it in here and try to aim it here. And it's like, no, you have to hit every ball the same way or else you aren't going to be too successful. And then obviously sometimes you got to bring out a little bigger of a club when you get into long, long distance kicks and do something a little different. But no matter what, if it's first quarter, end of the game, that kick could be the deciding factor. And so you always just try to go through every kick the same way and make them all. It's always the goal. Um, we'll come back. We'll take a quick break here on the flagship podcast with Cameron Dicker. Uh, so don't go anywhere. And if you're watching us on the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel, we'll we'll roll on with uh with Cameron Dicker. And and Cameron, you you know, obviously you make your reputation as the field goal kicker. And then um Ryan Buchevsky, poor guy, got busted up in against TCU a couple of years ago. Then he tears his ACL on a fake punt situation against West Virginia. You come in and average 43 yards per punt on the you know the the final punts that you had in uh at the end of 2020 and then you know Buchevsky's rehabbing um but you're punting all through the spring and what were the conversations like with Banks and Sarkeesian about you handling the punting going into 2021 yeah um yeah, Ryan's rehab didn't go great. He had some issues there, but um, and so it was tough to see that because he's like my best friend at Texas. And so 
it's tough for him to be going through that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but it was more so Isaac was the guy they thought they were going to have punting this year and going into spring ball. I was just coming off shoulder surgery. So the first day of spring ball was my first day kicking last year. And so that was my first day able to kind of do anything. And they had me going out there and hitting like the twos reps just to hit them so that it would be balls to returners. And I got to the point where I was like, hey, if I'm going to be doing this, like, like at least look at me so I can compete a little, give me a chance to win the spot and like make it fun for me. And they were like, oh, OK, I didn't know you want to do that. And so I started competing for the spot with Isaac and I ended up beating him out and then talked with Sark a couple times. And he's like, dude, are you sure you're going to be able to handle doing all three? We changed my practice schedule down to a one day a week practice schedule from two days a week from previous years, just to make sure um, I was still fresh going into games and not overdoing anything. And then, yeah, it was just, making sure I was listening to my body throughout the whole season and doing all the recovery and extra stuff to end the lifts to make sure I was good throughout the season and just not trying to do too much. So how did that go? I mean, obviously the punting was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, the field goals were phenomenal, but how did you notice a big change in terms of the demand? Um, there wasn't as much kicking as I'd done in previous years. I mean, I only kicked on Thursdays, which was like our lighter rep day. And so my practice was about five punts in practice on uh, with the team on Thursday and about six field goals. And that was it for the week for me. So and maybe like four kickoffs. And then so game day was really like the day I did most of my kicking. But those other days, I mean, obviously I'd warm up and kick alone off on the side and stuff at practice on Thursday and do everything. But full live team reps was only like total of 15 reps with kickoffs, punting and field goals. And so that was tougher to have to do just because obviously you're not getting as many reps. But I think I was at the point where I know what I needed to do and um I could kind of control my body and know what I, I mean, just take care of business of what I need to do. So were you, um, Buchevsky's now in the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. Um, were you surprised by that decision? No, I mean, he, so he and I graduated together in December and so he's back home in Australia right now. And so we talk like every couple of days and, um, I think he's just looking for a fresh start uh, he's graduated, got what he needed here at Texas, got his degree. And so he's pumped about that. And I think it just it was time for him to move on and go somewhere else. I don't, I don't think he was going to be competing with Isaac here. And he just wanted to go home rehab alone and be able to do some things and take care of his body a little bit more so he could go to another school and try to have a good performance there and have some fun again, play a little bit more college football and hopefully get a master's in something. You said his rehab didn't go quite as planned. Mm -hmm. um, did he have like a setback that affected his ability to to punt the way he felt like he could? Yeah, I think there was just issues where every time he'd go out and punt, it would just have reoccurring like pain and things. And so I think there's a little tendonitis or something, but um, it was just things that he was obviously was bummed it was like a tough thing to go through just because when you have that surgery, you're hoping everything goes well and it's the six month protocol and you're healthy. Everything's fine, but it's, I think a lot harder than people think it is. And so it was tough to see him go through that, but he did a really good job going through everything and being supportive with me throughout the season and kind of helping me with everything. And so I really love that. Yeah. You mentioned it. It's going to be a whole new crew for Texas mm -hmm. in 2022 because uh, Justin Motter, the the snapper, has is moving on. Yeah. Um, obviously, Buchevsky was was holding, and um, you you were kicking field goals, punting, and um, and doing it all. Uh, what uh, from a mindset standpoint of the the kickers? I mean, you know Auburn. Do you know Gabo at yeah. all? Lived with Gabo last year. Okay, and. And then Will Stone mm -hmm. from Regents. I don't know. Do you know him? Yep. Helped get him to Texas. Okay. Okay. 
So yeah. give give us give us the Cameron Dicker scouting report on on these uh, three field goal kickers. Yeah, I think uh, it'll be good. Burton Gab, Bert, yeah, Burton Gabo did really well this last year during the season because I only kicked Thursdays, so they would kick on Tuesdays and Wednesdays sometimes, and so they both did real well in practice. And so I mean, they have a chance. Both of those dudes. It's not like Will's coming in having a for sure starting spot, and so he's got to come in and earn his spot as well as those dudes got to know he's the guy being brought in on scholarship and they've got something to prove as a walk on just, Hey, I'm here to battle it out with Will. And this is why, and they both have good legs and can make kicks 55 and in. And so they both, I think have the chance to start. It's just going to come down to who performs well. Um, All of them are great guys. And so it's just going to be interesting to see who, who ends up playing the role and does what they need to do to win the starting job? How how is uh, how is Banks as as a coach? We know under Herman he wouldn't say the names of the kickers and punters. It's kind of goofy. Hmm. Um, but uh, tell well, yeah. First of all, tell us what that experience was like, and then what it was like, um, you know, playing for Sark and Banks. Yeah. No. Uh... Freshman year coming in, it was a little tough. I mean, it was one where, you know, you obviously want to have the respect of the coaches. And at times it felt like it wasn't there. And then I think going into sophomore year, um, it started to grow. And I mean, I'm sure the respect was there the whole time, but at the same time, it was felt like it wasn't as much. But um, as time went on, I think I I grew to really like Herman. I think a lot of the team did. And so, um, it was, he was a cooler dude than I thought he was when I got there my freshman year. He was just, once we sat down and would talk and stuff, it was just a whole different guy than just calling me kicker. And then also kicker sounds like dicker. So I just pretend he was saying my name anyways. It's like, oh, thanks coach. Don't worry about it. And so I was uh, fine with it anyways. It was, I mean, it's not – I don't really care too much. What My position coaches are mainly who I deal with. The head coaches are, like, there and they hire the special teams coordinator, but they aren't as involved in special teams because there's a reason a guy's getting paid for it. And so it's like every once in a while you deal with the head coach, but most of the time it's always with your coordinator. And so I've had a new coordinator every year. Obviously, Banks was his last one, and Banks has done a really good job. Um, very professional guy and just knows his stuff. He punted in college, tried NFL for a little bit, and then he just – yeah, he understands kind of what's going on and understands the, like, amount it affects my body and how to talk to me about it, what we can do here, and how to look at things properly that have really helped me this last year. Yeah, Banks was the punter on that Washington State team that went to the Rose Bowl with Ryan Leaf, played Michigan um, back in the day. Did he make any kind of, um, you know, did he offer any kind of coaching that helped you uh, take that average from 43 to to 46.7? It was more so just working and looking at my uh, form I have because everybody's got something a little bit different and so working develop and make your thing as consistent as possible and so he did a good job just helping me there and trying to simplify things and not I mean not make things too complicated just because once you once you start thinking so much it's hard to do well so now you are uh, one of two Longhorns headed to the NFL combine you Mm -hmm. and Josh Thompson um, so tell us what it's been like since you declared for the NFL draft and, and, uh, maybe even what you're hearing right now in terms of, you know, feedback from the, from the NFL or what your agent's telling you. Yeah. Um, it's been good. I mean, it's, it's been weird not being in school and workouts and everything, but I've been in Dallas living with my coach, Brian Egan with one-on-one kicking and then been going to some Coles kicking events and doing some training sessions with him and some of the other top guys. And we've all been getting together some of the top stop, uh, some of the top specialists in the draft. And so it's been, it's been a fun time gotten to know some of the other specialists a lot better. Um, Right now I work out with the LSU kicker, Cade York and the SMU kicker, Blake Mazza. 
And so we've been in Dallas training together this whole time. And so it's fun to really get to know these dudes and get to build relationships because in the day, who knows how long you're kicking. Everybody wants to kick for a long time. But if you build relationships along the way, people do some cool things and maybe you can be a part of it at some stage. And then, um, yeah, it's just been weird not being in classes. I work out, kick in the morning, and then I'm done by like, 2 p.m. and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do today? So I've been picking up some golf, playing some frisbee golf, and recently starting to bowl. I'm liking bowling. I think that's going to be fun. And okay. then hopefully soon, I think after the combine, I want to start working on building my Chinese back again. So figuring out a way to do that. Nice. Mm -hmm. When you say building back your Chinese, I used to be fluent in Chinese and Mandarin and I'm like decent at it now. I just, I want to be back at that stage where I can say, yeah, I'm pretty good at it. Cause right now someone asks me like, eh, it's okay. Um, and so one of those things where I can, I mean, while I'm sitting around, it's like, it's like doing something. And so it gives me something to do while I'm just waiting around sometimes. Yeah, definitely in the category of things you didn't know about Cameron Dicker fluent in mandarin how did you pick that up uh i lived in china for 11 years and so i was born in hong kong lived a little bit in taiwan and then lived in shanghai from first grade to fifth grade or kindergarten to fifth grade and so grew up living in china and then moved to austin into lake travis in sixth grade in 2011. okay so parents work took you over to Asia? I was in supply chain management. And so that brought us over into China. And then my mom started a travel agency and still has that luxury travel agency. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. What, uh, what do you remember most about living over there? Honestly, it was a lot of fun. Um, as a kid, there's not, you don't have to follow the rules. So it's a lot more fun as a kid than I think it would be as an adult, but, um, it's, I don't know. We got to travel a lot because my mom's job. And so that was really cool. I got to see and experience some really cool things that most people don't throughout their whole life. And I got to as a kid growing up. And so I'm really grateful and happy about that. And then I just grew up playing soccer there. And so I was friends with a lot of Europeans and everybody who was there. And we lived all pretty much in the same area. And so it was really fun to just grow up in that atmosphere where everything was outside playing soccer like all day. And so how do you yeah. think that experience shaped you as a as a person and as a competitor? Um, as a person, I think it made me more open to a lot of things. I'm very happy to go try new things. I think that's like a fun thing I need to do now just because, I mean, if I'm not doing something new, I get kind of bored soon. Um, and then it allowed me to kind of be able to connect with people that, Typically, I wouldn't normally be like, oh, let me go hang out with this person or oh, let me go see what this is all about. Just like traveling around, like we went to Mongolia one time and we stayed in like the yurt, the <clears throat> it's like the place where all the north, like the people live there. And so it's literally like almost like a big tent in like the middle of the desert. And they just have like horses around, they had no cars. And I think we drank like fermented yak milk or something. And it was one of the grossest weirdest things i've done but i was like what a cool experience that i like got to do one time wow fermented yak milk it was something like that i don't know it Sounds was awful it was something where i was just like oh i just gotta i just gotta swallow i can't like you make the face and you just swallow and they're all kind of laughing because nobody really spoke english and then we're like speaking english like the broken english trying to talk to them and yeah it's just one of those funny cool things to do <laughs> That sounds like something you'd have to do on the challenge or something. Right? It was it was weird. It was weird, but it was that, good. That is a trip. Yeah. Well, so obviously the legacy, um, you're by going three of three on field goals against K-State in your last game as a Longhorn, you end up um, passing Phil <laughs> Dawson uh, for most uh, kicks made, tying him for most kicks attempted. Um, and – and Phil Dawson recently took the head coaching job at Hyde Park. Mm -hmm. And of course, Justin Tucker, most accurate kicker in NFL history, also Longhorn. Have you been in touch with those guys uh, during your time at Texas um, and built 
especially now that you're heading uh, toward, you know, the NFL draft, what uh, you have any relationship with those guys? Yeah, I actually reached out to them, but I talked to Phil Dawson, started talking with him, I think my sophomore year, just trying to see that's when, right when he moved out of Austin, I was trying to see if he could get together at some point and just kind of go kick. And it's always good to kick with some dude, some guys that have been like really high level and done some cool things. And so um, wanted to see if he was able to, but he was out of town and then actually reached out to both of them again at, um, when I was deciding if I was going to come out or stay just because they've both been in my shoes and they've, they're both pretty successful people I'd say. And so I uh, thought it'd be important to kind of get some advice from those guys and see what they had to say. And both of them were very respectful and easy to talk to. And so I was very happy that I had the chance to talk with them and they gave me some good advice and yeah, it was just good to kind of build a relation, little relationship there throughout. Yeah. What'd they tell you? Um, more, more or less kind of take what you have. You're given some big opportunities right now. So roll with what you have because you never know what happens in the future. And then also like do what your heart wants to don't make a decision based on, <clears throat> something else other people are telling you do what you want to do and end of the day so you don't look back and you aren't like oh i wish i would have done this oh, i wish I wouldn't have this you can always look back and say i know i did this for this reason and so um yeah i just think both that both those advice were just great for me and kind of just eased my mind a little bit throughout the process yeah and both those guys were undrafted mm -hmm. and Dawson kicked for 20 years in the NFL and Tucker's, as we said, the all, you know, the most accurate uh, field goal kicker in NFL history. Yeah. What did they tell you from that standpoint? I mean, usually only one or two kickers get drafted per cycle. Mm -hmm. So what's your mindset going into the, into the draft? Yeah, you hope, I mean, I'd hope I'd be a number one, two guy. I um, think I could be the number one guy, but I mean, it all comes down to how I do once I get into private workouts with coaches. And so end of the day, the pressure's on me, you know, but it's one of those things where it's fun to be able to go out there and I get the opportunity to decide what happens with me. Um, but at the same time, like Phil Dawson, his year, when I was talking to him, he was talking about he was like the top kicker in the class but no kicker got drafted that year so some years it's like yeah we'll take we'll take three kickers this year four kickers but then there's other years where it's like even though there's good guys they aren't going to take any and so end of the day you'd love to be drafted but it's just one of those things where you it's god's plan and you kind of roll with what happens and make the most of the opportunities you get once it comes what stands out to you most about um each of those guys. I'll start with Phil Dawson. Um, super family oriented dude. He was very, very nice talking to. He's a Texas man. And so it was just good. I don't know. He just was like a wise guy who was just able to talk to me and just be a normal human and just interact with me and know what experiences I've gone through and be able to kind of just help me through that next path. So it was cool to just be able to talk with him and see everything. What about uh, Tucker? Uh, he's a cool dude. He's a, he's an interesting man, obviously, with his opera and everything that you see online. But he's a very cool dude, um, very nice guy. And so he was helpful and just he was just really telling me kind of like, hey, you have opportunities. I wasn't the top dude coming out of college. Things have obviously worked out for me now. I'm happy with everything that's happened. But you're in a different boat right now and you have the opportunities to go to do this and this and why not go take that? Cause you never know what's going to happen. And I thought that was really cool coming from him and that he was rooting for me and just kind of excited to see where everything went. And so it was, it was good talking to him and hearing everything. Well, you're uh, you've been training in Dallas, the Cowboys mm -hmm. might need a kicker. Who knows? Yeah, that'd be lovely. Yeah. That would, that'd be, Convenient, right? Yep. <laughs> um, do you, I mean, is there a team you'd love to play for or how do you look at that? Um, I grew up not even really watching football. I don't even think I knew what football was until like I was 10. 
I, I mean, growing up in China, it was soccer for me. And so my friends were European. So we'd get together on weekends and watch soccer games early in the morning. Um, and so it was just, yeah, now that I'm here, it's kind of weird because I'm like, oh, this is cool. And it's kind of like a new, another new thing for me just because like college football, I didn't know much about until I moved here. Then it, all of a sudden it was like, oh, there's a huge college football team here in Austin. And then um, pro football, I don't really know too much about. And it's one of those things where it's like going to be a new experience and new fun for me. And so not really a team that I've rooted for in the past or anything. And so I'm happy kind of anywhere. But obviously no state income tax is a great thing and a great perk about being in Dallas or Houston. So easy to stay in Texas, but I'm, I'm ready to move and go wherever I need to. I'm, I'm excited for a little bit of a change. Well, do you have any uh, pre kick ritual that you, that you go through? Um, not really kind of a post kick one after every kick. When I come off the field, it's always, I pour water on my head and shake it around and then spit it out everywhere. And so People started to realize that I think this last year, after three years where I've done it every kick, no matter if it's cold or whatever. So, yeah. So they started moving away from you? Uh, some people did. And then obviously, like the last staff, people knew to, like, there was the splash zone. And so you knew not to be in the splash zone. This new staff, people didn't know that. So a couple people got splashed. And I was like, hey, you're in the splash zone. Sorry about that. <laughs> and, uh, some people, the ladies aren't too happy when they get splashed that the coaches don't really care. They're just dealing with it. But the ladies on the sideline usually aren't too happy. And I was like, Hey, I'm sorry. I'll just, I'll just yell out splash zone next time. And you know, what I, mean? <laughs> I love it. What, uh, any memory that, uh, is going to stand out more than another from your time at Texas, Cameron? Um, honestly, probably just though you kick, I think that one is just, one that I'll always remember and always have fun just knowing and like thinking about that and being able to just be proud of that moment. And then what was that post game locker room? Like it was fun. Um, I was in interview stuff though for a while after. So I didn't, I wasn't there for a lot of it. And then all of a sudden it was just like, okay, I'm back in there. And so it was, it was a lot of fun being in there and just, seeing everybody happy. I mean, the reason I do this is to make everybody else happy and proud of what they've done because I play a little role in the big, uh, in the big team's role. And so it's cool to see the dude who sacrificed their bodies happy and I'm able to help them get there. If you weren't a kicker, mm -hmm. um, what profession would you be pursuing? I'd love to be playing soccer still. I think that's been my passion my whole life. And so that's kind of been my number one sport throughout my life and one I still watch and everything. But obviously football is the path that I'm going down. I'm really happy I am. I love kicking. Um, but, I mean, other than that, recently I've, I have started kicking lessons last spring. And so I love kind of engaging with kids and being able to teach them and push them into the next – stage of life and kind of just work through everything and be able to guide them throughout the process that I've gone through. And so have a couple of local young guys that I'm helping out and helping their parents kind of understand what's worth going to. What do you think? Like they, they text me, Hey, what do you think about going to this? How's this? Like, how do I navigate dealing with a coach in this way? And so that stuff is fun to kind of help kids through and just kind of help shape like the next wave of kickers. And so it's a fun, fun experience for me. So if an NFL team asks you, what do you like doing most kicking or punting? Yeah. What do you, what do you say? I say I'm more of a, I'm a kicker that can punt. Um, I'm obviously happy to do whatever a team would like me to do, but I'd say my whole life I've worked on kicking more than punting. Um, and so, I mean, I did great punting this year, but it's one of those things where, yeah, I, I think I can develop it into a really good skill, but right now I think my kicking's better than it is punting, but at the same time, I'm, it's not for me to judge at the end of the day for whatever team would like to pick me as either one. I'm very happy to do either. 
Yeah, it's funny because Tucker started off as a punter and finished as a kicker. Mm-hmm. I mean, both, but um, started off as a punter. And and then, of course, you know, from a punting standpoint, Michael Dixon, Ray Guy Award winner. Yeah. Uh, have you been in touch with him at all? Yeah, talked to him a little bit. Um, Ryan's his cousin, and so um, when he's in town, we've done some things. And so it's – he just bought a place in Austin, I think, and so he's here in the off season. So I'm sure I'll be out there with them when he gets back. Why is he so good? Uh, I think he's just able to lock in in those moments he needs to, and then he has a lot of tools in his toolbox punting, and so gives him the like this last year he had his double punt where it got blocked and he's able to just kind of make a play happen. So he's athletic and just makes things happen and understands what he needs to do. And is one of those guys that's kind of like, awesome, let's go out there and let's roll, like putting on a show. And so he's one of those dudes who understands what he's doing and does it really well. Well, Cameron, this is an exciting time. We really, really appreciate you taking a little time for us here on the flagship podcast. We'll be watching you at the combine and and on into the draft and uh and we'd love to stay in touch with you man oh yeah awesome thank you hey cameron dicker ladies and gentlemen dicker the kicker and that's his uh that that's i mean it doesn't get any better than that um and uh great stuff with cameron dicker thanks so much everybody for listening for cameron dicker i am chip brown we'll see you see you over at horns 247.com Until the next time here on the flagship podcast, stay safe and keep the faith.